I've, I've got a book of notes that's been with me for years and years and years, and it's just full of scraps that I've added in, and they're all falling out, and I have to get expensive tape to actually tape the book here, and the uh, masking tape. And um, so, two nights ago, uh, Linda and I were at home whenever we got a phone call from a very distressed young girl that we know. She was literally in hysterics. And she had just had a little baby boy, and the pregnancy had been very uh, traumatic, so much so that the hospital actually offered her counseling. But amazingly, they sent her home within 24 hours with the baby. I, I just find that so strange if you've had a, a traumatic birth. But here the baby went yellow, started to shiver, and she was traumatized still by the events of the birth, and now her baby. And one of the problems was, too, that in the father's side, there'd been a whole history of babies dying. And uh, Anyway, it all came together that she was on the phone saying, please play, please pray. And just after Linda put the, the, the phone down, that we agreed it's best if we get in the car and go out and see her if she's on her own. So we got in the car, and she lived about a mile away. But when we got there, she had already gone up to the hospital. So we, we went up to the A&E hospital as well. And we asked for her, and the next thing, she was brought out um, from down a corridor, and she was traumatized. This normally stable girl was just traumatized, crying uncontrollably. And one of her aunts was, was with her. And so we went up, and we sat at the back, and she said, okay, and pray for me, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. And I had my arm around her, and Linda had her arm around the other side. And then another aunt arrived, and then the mother arrived. And they're all Christian. We're all Christian. But she is traumatized. And her mom's there, and her mom's two sisters are there. And they're saying all the right things. I'm doing the right things. And, and all of a sudden, coming down the corridor was her father. And she said, there's my dad. And she got up and she ran into his arms and threw herself in his arms. And he just stood there without saying a word. And she just cried in his chest and he just stood there. And we were all left behind. <laughs> and quite happy to be left behind, I might add. And I just saw this, this daddy. And now she felt safe. Yet her mom, who loved her, was there. Her two aunts were there who loved her. She knows that we love her. We've known her for years. We traveled up to the hospital to be with her, but dads, there's something that a good dad brings where you feel safe. And as I looked at that and I said, Lord, you want all your children to know that they have a dad, that they have a dad they always dreamed of having but never thought they could have. They could have the dad that will never reject them, will never harm them. But because we're all so damaged, we're too frightened to do what she did and run up the corridor and throw herself into her daddy's arms because she knew dad was safe. And I thought how many people in that hospital, as I looked around the emergency, the A&E, the waiting room, I saw brokenness everywhere. I saw brokenness on all the faces of so many people there. And I thought, how many of their dads are going to come walking in that they'll run over? I, I just thought it wouldn't be very many. You see, the father was the great prize that Jesus came to bring, not the great dread. I'll say that again. Father God was the prize, the great prize, not the great dread. You see, Jesus said, nobody comes to my Father but by me. I am the way, I am the door. In other words, I'm not the finishing place, I'm the way. I'm not the finishing post, I'm the way, I'm the door. I built a bridge, the dividing wall is gone. My dad wants you to come home. My dad wants you to come home, and there's only one way. And come on. Hope we go, Jesus. I'm safe with you. 
I don't feel safe with Father. There's a verse in the Bible, Romans 8, 15. It says this, For you did not receive the... There's a bit of echo in this here. Is there any way you could drop that echo? Maybe it's just me. It's sort of bouncing back again on me. Um, Romans 8, 15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children. And if children, then heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Now, I'm going to spend 15 minutes unpacking that one verse because that one verse is dynamite. Dynamite. I used to think when I read that verse as a young Christian, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cried, Abba, Father. I used to think, well, uh, adoption, oh, hello people over here. <laughs> just, just, I'm looking down here, hello. Just, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Suddenly felt rude there. That, that, uh, yeah, if you could kind of picture yourself around here. And, and, yeah, okay. um, and I thought, yes, the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. I thought, well, yes, adoption's good, but, it, but I sort of secretly thought, but it's not as good as being the real thing. I mean, adoption's good. It's wonderful, and I love it, but it's not really. But then I heard a minister give a talk one day, and I completely changed my mind. I completely changed my mind. Yes. Have you heard this course before? Have you read the book? I don't know. Anyway, if I lose my place, I'm going to ask you where I go next, okay? Um, you see, when you're going to have a baby, you kind of put your money in, pull the lever, and you see what you get. It's a bit more complicated than that, but Jill Southern does very good teaching on it, okay? But you get what you get. Oh, you get a boy, you get a girl, you get an extrovert, you get an introvert. You get a cheeky one, you get a nice one, you get a tantrumy one, you get a show-off, you get a wee reclusy one. You, you kind of get what you get. Okay? But with adoption, not only do you get to choose of your own free will, you get the whole history of what you're getting. So if I was going along to adopt, they could say, now this fella here, you know, he fights with all the rest of them, you know, you know steals their packed lunches and what have you. This one here wets the bed every night. This one here like, fights with everybody. This one, you know, you get the whole history, the whole CV, the whole background, all the good points, the bad points, the difficulties, the traumas, the shocks. You get the whole package, nothing hidden. And then of your own free will, you say, I would like to adopt this one into my family. So whenever, whenever you come into God's family, he wasn't shocked that you appeared. What? I've got him as a... Oh, goodness me. Oh, Gabriel, what were you doing? Jesus, what were you doing? Don't you know about him? You know, <laughs> see, if you sit in the front row, you're always going to get it. So you just... That's why people sit at the back. Um, when he chose you, and Jesus said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. And then he said, nobody comes to me unless the Father draws them. So you thought, as I did, I went up to the front, got down my knees and said, Lord, I give you my life. And I thought, oh, how's that? And then I realized, actually, no, it was the end of a process that my heavenly Father began and said, despite his history. There's a few marks on it. I want him. And the Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit drew me to Jesus and showed me that I needed a Savior and a Lord. And so when I finally got there, I thought, hey, I chose Jesus and actually found that I'm adopted out of my Father's heart. So, he wants you. 
your dad might have thought, not another baby, not another mouth to feed. Oh my goodness, not another girl, not another boy. Oh dear, help us, I can't afford them. None of that, none of that was ever, or ever would be in your heavenly father's heart. Do you understand? You receive, you receive the spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Now, that's a word that we don't use, but let me unpack it for you. If you went into Farnham, let's say it was really sunny today, and you went into Farnham, and you're sitting outside a coffee shop, just people watching, having a nice quiet coffee, and there's a father comes along with a little boy and a little girl, and as they walk past, you hear the little boy, the little girl saying, Daddy, Daddy, can I have an ice cream? Okay. Let's say you then went to Dublin and watched the exact same scene. You would hear them say, Da, Da, can I have an ice cream? If you went to Paris, you would hear, Papa, Papa, can I have an ice cream? If you went to Jerusalem today, you would hear, Abba, Abba, can I have an ice cream? You see, Abba means father, but only the children can use that word. So whenever our children were at home, they've all flown the nest now, we're so old, but flown the nest now. And if, if a stranger came to the door, they would knock the door, and if my children opened the door, they would say, can I speak to your father, please? And they would say, Daddy, somebody at the door for you. So it's the same person, but only the children can say, Daddy. Do you understand? So people outside say, you know, Father God. I say, of course, we call him Father God as well. Of course, it's a very dignity. But the Spirit himself witnesses with our spirit that we can call him Daddy. If you're in Jerusalem, call him Abba, and they'll understand. Say to your next-door neighbor, Abba, and they'll, know what you, they'll actually think it's a pop group that you're talking about, okay? Okay. <laughs> So you can call him in your language whatever daddy means. You see, everyone here has had a father. I mean, in theory, if a man had sexual intercourse with 365 girls one a day and they all got pregnant, he could father 365 children. But it wouldn't make him a dad. Do you understand? A dad is a completely different creature altogether. And you see, you know when, you're, when you've come home to your heavenly father, when you can actually say, Daddy, Daddy. And you know the spirit within you witnesses that. Yeah, how does that feel? How does that feel? That feels good, Lord. Good, that's the way it's meant to feel. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children. And if children, then heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Now, when my mother, my father died about 15, 16 years ago, my mother died about 10 years ago, and she left a little pensioner's bungalow. And um, she left a will but it was a will that was just written, handwritten on a piece of paper. There was no witnesses to it. She had changed her mind several times over the years because one of my sisters, her husband, left and went off with another woman, so he was stroked out. And there was, and there was grandchildren come in, and they were added in, etc. So it was a little piece of paper. So the solicitor said, that is not a will. That will never be officially accepted as a will. And they say, I said, well, that's just our mom. That's the way things work. She said, let me, let me take it to the high court. Anyway, about... Two or three months later, we got a call to come down and see this lady solicitor. And so myself and my two sisters went in, and she said that the court have actually passed it as a, as a legal will because there's nobody making any claims on it. She has left everything equally to the three of you. You are all joint heirs. So in other words, even though I'm first born, the most handsome, the most intelligent in our family... <laughs> My mother decided that my two sisters should get exactly the same. So I got the same as Sharon, Sharon got the same as Jill, Jill got the same as me, etc., etc., etc. But it was that word when she said, you're joint heirs. I thought, where have I seen that before? 
And I thought, oh, Lord, no. Oh, come on, Lord, no, no, come on. Look, I, I can get air of God. I can get that. You know, a crumb, but a joint air with Jesus. Oh, come on, Lord, that's too. And when, I've been teaching this for years and years and years, and I used to say, this is the one part that I haven't got yet. All the rest of it that I'm teaching, I've got it. This bit is still too big for me. But about two or three years ago, I suddenly got it. I suddenly got it. And now I know and can actually teach it with authority. I can now absolutely tell you that God means that. That I am a joint heir with Jesus. And so are you. Because God has no favor. Not only are you an heir of God, not only can you call him Abba, but you're a joint heir. You're a joint heir. And I thought, well, now, there must be a way to put this to the test. And I thought, right, you said of Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That's a big title, beloved. So if I'm beloved, if we're beloved, then you must somewhere in the Bible say that to us. So I got out my computer, went in, typed in beloved in the New Testament, and counted over 50 times in the New Testament, whether as individuals or corporately, we are called beloved. We are called, just like Jesus, we are called beloved. And Jesus said that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Now, doesn't that give you, an, isn't that a father who gives you an identity? There's no rejection there. There's no lack of worth there. There's no, I'm busy, go away there. You see, if he was always too busy, he wouldn't keep telling us to pray. Pray just means that you talk to God. That's what it means. We sort of think we have to go into a funny language when we talk to God. I remember being at a, at a meeting one night I was teaching and, and one, of the, the, one of the elders, decided, you know, he was opening the meeting in prayer. We're, we're all having a normal talk, cup of tea, yes, 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 nice day, lovely day. Yeah, mm -hmm. And suddenly he goes, God Almighty, we praise you. We, I'm, I said, oh, gives me get the cotton wool buds, you know. And I, I was nearly blown out of my chair. I opened my eyes and I watched him and I thought, you don't think God's close at all? Sure you don't. Because, I'm going to pick on you again. I, 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 because I know you're close. So I'm going to say, hello, how are you doing? It's, good. it's lovely to see you. But if I think you're at the back of the hall, I say, hello, you're at the back of the hall. How are you doing? Okay. Yeah, You couldn't write the script, you couldn't. <laughs> I'll never make a, a politician. They kiss babies, I make them cry. Um, but do you understand? Often how you talk to God reveals if you understand that he is with you. never leave you, never forsake you. He's the same yesterday. He's the same today. And predictably, he won't have a mood swing and change his mind tomorrow. You might and probably will, but he won't. Of course, whenever you're adopted it can take you a while to feel that you really are part of the family. When Linda and I were saved, God used a, an evangelist called Rob Frost, who sadly died some years ago, and it was a week-long week um, sort of summer camp. And so anytime we saw Rob Frost's name mentioned in any of the Christian media, it, we paid attention to it because he was the evangelist that God used to, to bring us home. And... Rob Frost and his wife had a teenage son and they adopted another teenage boy. 
Now that is courage, isn't it? I often think that if somebody could invent a tablet that would put a child into a beautiful sleep at the age of 13, <laughs> and they woke up at the beautiful age of about 23, 24, you would be the richest person. If you went public, shares would go ballistic. People would sell kidneys, sell their homes, their golf clubs. I've got to have one of those pills, right? Adopting babies is so cute. But a teenager... Da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da. I think we need a bigger house. Um, and so, knowing everything about him, they, they said, we want you to come into our family. And we love you as much as we love our son. Oh, oh yes, Mr. and Mrs. Ross, thank you very much. So, thank you so much. Oh, yes, well, thank you. Very kind of you to come into. He might have understood it in his theology, but he certainly didn't understand it with his heart. Because, hey, he's forgotten. <laughs> I'm adopted. And they tried very hard, but there was always that, that gap. And as they said, teenagers eat a lot. And about 3 o'clock in the morning, they would hear a bedroom door open and they would hear footsteps going down the stairs, down into the kitchen, open the door. A bowl come out, cornflakes come out, shuffle, 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 fridge open, milk, glug, 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 crunch, crunch, crunch. Bowl in the sink and spoon for mum to wash up in the morning, back up the stairs again, bedroom door closed. And then maybe 20 minutes later, they'd hear another bedroom door open very quietly. And they'd hear the odd creak as somebody was walking down the stairs. And they'd hear the kitchen door open with only the faintest squeak. They'd just hear the clink of the bowl, a little bit of noise. And then they'd hear the tap going on as the bowl was washed and dried and put back and the spoon was washed and dried and put back. And then they'd hear footsteps climbing up the steps back and then closing the door again. They said it broke their heart. Broke their heart. But then one night they heard one bedroom door open and another bedroom door open and two sets of footsteps gone down. Two plates come out, crunchy, yakety yak, crunch, crunch, crunch. Two bowls in the sink for mum to wash up. Two spoons for mum to wash up, back up the stairs, and two doors slammed, and they raised it, and they cried, and they worshipped God. They said, at last, at last, he understands. He finally, finally got it. And you can come boldly before the throne when you're hungry any time at all, and make as much noise as you want. Because you're a joint heir with Jesus. You're beloved. And do you know what beloved means? Be loved. You know, at the Jordan, when God says, this is my beloved son, and then... He, Jesus is driven out into the wilderness to have this confrontation with the devil. And the devil says, if you're the son of God, he left out one word. He left the word beloved out. Isn't that interesting? Just at the Jordan, this is my, not just my son, this is my beloved son. And then, virtually no time later, the devil is saying to him, if you're the son of God. You see, when that word beloved is dropped, doesn't that change the sentence? But the devil says, if you're God's daughter, if you're God's son, you say, ah, you forgot a word. <laughs> you forgot a word. <laughs> that takes the sting out of the sentence, doesn't it? it doesn't, the sentence doesn't sound quite the same. Because God went to extraordinary lengths to let you know that you're a joint heir 
I'll say it again, that Jesus said, that the world may know that you have sent me, part one, and part two, have loved them as you have loved me. Do you know, even psychiatrists all agree that people have three basic needs, to be loved, to be valued, and to belong. To be loved, to be valued, and to belong. The God of this world goes out of his way through the culture, through the media, through damaged fathering, through everything, to say, you're not loved. You're just a bundle of chemical junk. You have no inherent value. You're just random stuff. You're not loved. You have no value. Belonging, you don't belong. When you die, all the atoms scatter and remake something else. You have no destiny. You have no value. But then he would say that, wouldn't he? But your Heavenly Father says something different. He said, you are loved. How do I know? You see, I love all our children. And much as I love you in a way that you love a brother and sister, uh, and much as I love friends and Christian, but much as I love my team that have been with me for 12 years, I really do love them. They're like family to me. But I might be willing to die for them. Mm. But I wouldn't put money on it. But it's possible. You know, it's, it's given the right circumstances and a sunny day. And, you know, it, it, it could happen. But I'll tell you what would never happen. I would never let one of my children die for you. That's a no-no. God could have sent Gabriel. said, Gabriel, way down and die for them. Create another angel there. Um, but he sent his son. Whom he loved. That's the highest value that he could show you. That is the highest value. That is the highest value for you, your worth. This should be the power of the defilement of sin and the value of your worth and how he sorts it out. Let all the sin go on my son whom I love. And just you realize what you're worth. As I watch my son going through this, because it'll make a way for you to come home to me. If I didn't love you, I wouldn't sit and watch that. But you're such worth, I want you so much that this is what I have to do because that is the worth that you have. Do you see, the start of the most common prayer, the Lord's Prayer, what are the first two words? I love the part where Jesus, I, I, I often learned the Bible by imagining that I was there. So as I read it, I kind of picture I was in the crowd. I kind of picture I could see Jesus telling that. I, I picture I was there. So I sort of picture if I'm Jesus and you're the kind of crowd. And Jesus says this, don't worry about your life. I don't know why he says it, because we never do, sure we don't. They maybe had to fill up just extra pages in the Bible so they kind of put these sentences in. Christians worry about our life. Oof. Don't worry about your life. Do you know, what, do you know what, what God means? Do you know what he really means when he means don't worry about your life? You have to go to the Greek and all to really get to it. But you know what he means? Don't worry about your life. Or as Paul would write in Philippians, do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, with prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to Abba. And then let the peace of God guard your heart and guard your mind in Christ Jesus. Do you understand? Because if you've got a dad that you're not safe with, if you've got a dad who doesn't care, well, by all means, you panic, you be anxious, by all means. 
But the more that you get to know Jesus as daddy, the more you realize, why did I worry so much? Don't worry about what you'll eat, as if we would. We never watch any cookery programs. No interest in whatsoever. What you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body. Ladies, you listen to this. And then, then Jesus says, look at the birds of the air. And you know what Jesus means when he says, look at the birds of the air? He means, look at the birds of the air. You're going to learn something. Because, you see, God created all things. And so the same personality that paints one painting and paints a second painting, it's the same. So the God who made the spiritual realm made the physical realm. So even though it's a fallen world and there's a lot of death and destruction in there, there's still more than enough beauty to realize the glory of God. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't gather into barns. You just imagine, we have birds that, and the, they come in our garden every day. And I never see them up in the trees at night going, oh, I'm really worried about tomorrow. Oh, do, do. oh me too. I mean, they might see the worms come up today, but will they come up tomorrow? That's what I say, you know. Oh, I don't know. Oh, I don't know, you know. For some reason, for some reason the birds seem to understand the heart of God better than we do. Look at the birds there. They don't sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your, he didn't say my heavenly father, yet your heavenly Abba, your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not of more value than the birdies? And why do you worry about clothing? This is the ladies again. Why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. Consider the flowers, how they grow. Isn't springtime beautiful? The daffodils and the bluebells and the cherry blossom and the apple blossom and the roses and the bumblebee. Aren't, aren't, aren't the colors of all the flowers stunning? Look at the flowers, how they grow. They don't toil. They don't spin. And yet I say to you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these now, if God so clothes the flowers in the field, which is here today and thrown into the oven tomorrow, just gone tomorrow, by summertime all the bloom will be gone, will he not much more clothe you, oh, you have little faith? And he's not slapping you by saying, oh, little faith. What he's saying to you is this. Have you ever seen people paddle at the edge of the sea with their, you know, their trousers up on their an- ankles here and think, I'm in the sea? No, you're not. You're only up to your ankles. So what Jesus is saying, you know, you think you're, that you're up waist in faith. You're not. You're still paddling about the shallows. Come on, come on. Trust him. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. See, your heavenly Father, our Father, teach us to pray this. Our Father in heaven. So I decided, well, it'd be, be good to look at the birds of the air. So, so my son and I, a youngest boy, even though he's 27 now, we still go, go fishing the odd time. And when you go fishing... You try and catch a particular species. So if it's trout, you would use artificial flies. If it's bream, you'd use sweet corn. If it's pike, you maybe use mackerel, etc. etc. We always put the fish back. Uh, they always get all cuddled and photographed and put in a wee net and test and put back again. So don't be too hard on me. Jesus like fishermen. And um, <laughs> we're actually one up on the rest of you. And um, but you see. Every angler secretly has a box of worms with him because everything eats a worm, right? But you see, if you're a real angler, you target a fish and that you show your skill. If it's carp, you'd use boilies and there's lots of skill. So the real skill is I'm going out to catch carp or I'm going out to catch pike and you catch what you went out for. But if you're not catching anything and nobody's looking, you stick on a worm. Everything eats a worm. Everything eats a worm, right? If reincarnation was real, you wouldn't want to come back as a worm, right? You really are... Really are at the bottom of the of the food chain, and so we went to buy some worms, but they're about five pound for a 
box, which was mostly soil. So I'm not paying that. We'll just dig them out of the garden. So we went up and dug around the garden, David and I, and not a worm, not one. And then somebody said, no, go out at midnight with a torch. And they're all on the surface. Thank you. Out with a torch in the garden. No worms. And somebody said, no, throw warm soapy water on at midnight. Wait 10 minutes and they'll all come up. So warm soapy water went out. Only bubbles in the grass and shiny bubbles and no worms. And somebody said, no, put a, put a piece of sacking down on the grass. Wait for two weeks and then all the worms will be there. So two weeks we lifted it up. No worms, just a light green patch that took about two weeks to, to color in the same as the rest of it. So I decided that, that obviously our garden had no worms. All tests had showed our garden had no worms. And then one morning, I had to come downstairs to get a drink about 5 o'clock in the morning. And it was just dawn. And I looked out, and there's two blackbirds in our garden wrestling with pythons. <laughs> and one minute, I think the worm's going to win. And next minute, I think the bird's going to win. And I was like, I think, where'd the, where'd the worms come from? And I thought, look at the birds in the air. You know, they're up there having a the snooze. And then just at the right time, the worms come up. Thank you. And then the worms go down again. I was out with a friend walking along the, the shore, and there was a kind of a very smooth lawn, very well-kept lawn at the edge of the shore. And I, I saw some seagulls standing with, which I thought they only one leg. I thought somebody had shot their legs off, but then the other seagull would come down and they'd do that, you see. So, and then I saw all the seagulls doing that there, you see, and I thought they must need a toilet or something. But, 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 but as, as somebody said, no, they're actually imitating rain so that worms think it's raining and come up. I went home, I says, David, I've got the answer. <laughs> and that is how Riverdance started. <laughs> <laughs> See you after lunch, okay? <laughs>